I'm going to talk about a very, very controversial subject, actually. But it's extremely important. And like what you see from the title of the video, it is an extremely controversial subject that has to do with God being a racist. Now, when I say racist, it's this. Yes, there are stuff in the Bible that you'd be shocked it is racist. However, I do not believe myself in racism in the terms of where you're supposed to hate another race, where we're supposed to think that white people are superior to all other minorities and then we should burn crosses and do lynching and Ku Klux Klan stuff. I think if you're any of that, and then you're trying to think, uh, seek consolation from this video, we have nothing to do with you, all right? That shows how much of a loser you are that you'd bump into this kind of video yeah. to find some consolation when we have no agreement with you whatsoever. That means how much of a minuscule crowd you are, how much of a loser crowd you are, yeah. that you find anything out there that would meet halfway, that would uh, meet with uh, your kind of empathy or agreement of your belief. That's how desperate you guys are. So no, I do not believe in that. However, you'd be shocked that there is some of that element in your Bible. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay, so first things first, I've explained myself what I do not believe in racism. <clears throat> but in the world's term of racism is where they believe in segregation. Now, when you hear segregation, they will automatically say that uh, if you practice where uh, one group of people is supposed to separate from another group of p people, then that is racism. Because we're supposed to culminate things together, we're supposed to integrate together, we're supposed to unite together. In that sense, I say that is wrong. Now, some of you might be shocked about that, but before I continue, I'm not talking about, don't get off on me on this, I'm not talking about the racism segregation in terms of the Jim Crow laws, okay? If you go to our church, we are the total opposite of a segregated church. We are like the most integrated church ever, more integrated and more loving and putting up with each other more than any Democrat and liberal you will find in this community who preach about love and integration, and they are so divided with each other that they will have mob riots going on and blaming somebody for their own problems. We don't believe in that. We believe that uh, whatever problem we have, that it is ourself we have to correct first. We don't pick on a race. We don't, that is totally evil. You pick on some kind of group or race to put all the blame on. That's totally racist right there. But I do believe that in this term of segregation, not in the world's misguided term of segregation, what they think, that's hateful, okay? In this term of segregation, which they never told you, this is originally what segregation should mean. This is from 1828, American Dictionary of the English Language. Separation from others aparting. In other words, groups separating from other groups. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to shock you shock you everybody you'd be surprised believes in segregation i'm going to prove to you that you are a closet segregationist i'm going to prove everybody that way and i'm going to prove that christians are more of an integrationist than the lost unbelievers who are more segregationist than we are i'm going to prove that okay but first let's establish this fact why do we believe in segregation and not in this hateful term of Jim Crow laws or whatever yeah. okay that's not what I'm saying why do we believe in this one group separating from other groups originally this is how God designed believe it or not now first of all go to Genesis 11 Genesis 11 this is going to be an interesting teaching and very eye-opening actually it'll help you believe it or not this is even in the secular viewpoint if you believe and agree and follow what I'm about to teach to you, you'll be able to get along with other cultures better. Your marriage is going to last longer in spite of differences. You'd be shocked. But the problem is people, hey, don't, I took multicultural class in psychology. 
So I know what I'm talking about. You know what the first step is? This is even a liberal class. The first step is you admit of your differences. You admit that there's something in you that there is a level of intolerance in there. Or even quote-unquote racism. You know why? You know why they teach that? You know why they teach that? Because that's supposed to be common sense. We all have that ingrained within us. But people want to pretend that it does not exist. Hey, I'm teaching you from what I from my multicultural liberal class in psychology and counseling. That's how you learn to tolerate people is you first admit your differences. That's good. You first recognize you have your differences. Okay, let's start off with Genesis chapter 11. Originally, everybody was united. And uh, verse 1, and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. Now look at verse 4, and they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. Let me know when I'm out of bounds. And let us make us a name, lest we be, what? Scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now look at that. They don't want to be scattered. They want to stay united. Did God want them to be scattered? Yes, because if you look at verse 9, Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord, what? Scatter them abroad. Did it say they scattered or the Lord scattered it? The Lord scattered it. So notice right here that God is who wanted them to separate from each other. He didn't want them to unite and stay together. Mankind wants to unite and stay together at verse 4. Let's stay united. Why is that wrong? I mean, isn't it great that if we all unite together? Sure, that might sound ideal, but there is one thing you misunderstand. You, there's nothing wrong with unity, but there is something wrong with unity when it has to do with your flesh here. Yeah, come on. There it is. This is the key. Flesh. Why? Because everybody's different. So because everybody's different, when all flesh unites together, there's tension. There's differences. There's uh, a lot of difficulty. And more so than that, it's a rebellion against God. It's a humanitarian effort. You want evidence? Look at today's uh, United Nations. What's the goal? A humanitarian effort to build up their own kingdom without God. That's right. It's to elevate mankind above God. Isn't that the attitude right here? You'll notice that at verse 4, that's their attitude. To elevate mankind. To build themselves up like they're God or something. You want evidence? Look at today when the whole world's uniting. They're trying to elevate mankind like God with their science, technology, nations uniting. So that's pretty obvious. That's the reason why the Lord doesn't want them to unite but he wants them scattered. So look at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. And then your other hand to go to Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. Now God, believe it or not, he wants everybody to be united. He originally does. He originally... He originally... Oh, put, it on your tie. put it on my tie. Okay, that's kind of yeah. that's kind of weird. Okay, maybe the devil doesn't like this teaching, huh? Hello, testing one, two, three. All right, we're going to look at Ephesians four. Ephesians four. God wants everyone united, but the thing is, when they're united, He wants them united in the spirit. Yeah. If the flesh is perfect, like the spiritual nature, see that? Then He wants them united. But the flesh has deficiencies and issues. It's best that they're all scattered and separated from each other. Because when all these deficiencies start uniting together, you create one big bad apple. That's the idea. Now look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So notice 
that God is all for unity, but in the context of what? Verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the what? Spirit. So it has to be spirit. Now, that's why, look at this, that's why our church is very mixed in our church. Why is that? Because we all share the same spiritual unity. We're saved in Jesus Christ. We got the right doctrine. We're Bible believers. And because of that, it doesn't matter what difference you have. We're all united together. That's called one body. See that? This one body is united here. But the flesh, there has to be separation and differences. So then look at Deuteronomy 32. God created us that way in our flesh. Well, originally, he didn't create us that way, but sin caused us to become that way. So God had to cause separation during Noah's time. Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. When the Most High, what? Divided to the nations their inheritance. When he, what? Separated the sons of Adam. He set the bounds of the people. See that? He separated them. He segregated them. Now look at Acts 17. Acts 17. You might say, why does God do that? Because their flesh is so hard and difficult. Let's be honest. We are self-centered people. So for us to make sacrifices on our part to try to get along with another person's flesh who is different from you is very, very difficult and stressful. That's why for thousands of years, different nations couldn't get along. Why? Their flesh couldn't get along from one different culture to get along with another person's culture. That was very difficult. Now, today's modernism world is trying to do that, but you can't do that all in the flesh while dropping the spirit. See, that? that's what the world's trying to do, but you can never do that. Look at the fruit of their unity in the flesh. You got riots going on. You got chaos going on. The country is more divided than ever. See, that's the fruits. That's their fruits. But if everyone stayed in their own divided group, in their flesh, what happens is it becomes more comfortable for them. And even in their flesh, there's a good chance. So... In this passage, if people are left to their own divided territories, it's easier for them, it's more natural for them to feel after the right things or even after God. So, a good evidence, if some of you really don't believe me, is this. You ever had an integrated marriage where you married someone from a different country, from a different culture, and then you both tried to serve God? Now look, it's possible, but think about it. In the flesh, naturally, it's a lot of stress and pain. you got to realize that. Even myself, you know, uh, when I went through it, I'm American, my wife's uh, Korean. Even though we're Korean by ethnicity, the country domains where we're from, the culture caused a lot of tension, actually, and a lot of getting used to it. It wasn't easy for our flesh. Think about even, think about this, <laughs> Why do people have divorce going sky high yeah. in America, even though they marry within their own nationality? You ever thought of that? Why do they easily divorce? Because it doesn't fit their character, their personality and preference. You know what Christians are? We're integrationists. We will stay till death do you part. Yeah. But the world easily practices segregation. And segregation with so many partners. Wow. See, I told you, everyone's a closet segregationist, whether they like it or not. You know why? We're all self-centered people. That's it. We're in the flesh. And in our flesh, it's hard to sacrifice and think about others. Yeah. So that's how the flesh is built. So God understands our flesh. See, everyone has to admit it's hard for our flesh. That's why they easily do divorce. So let's be honest, okay? Let's not be shy and let's just be honest, okay? The honest thing is, it is hard for our flesh to get along with someone that's different from us. Especially from a different culture, from a diff different ethnic background, from a different uh, religious perspective, from a different, shall I continue on and on and on? Family perspective, etc. So let's be honest, it's hard. It's very hard in the flesh. It's easier we find someone that matches our tastes and interests and similarities. Yeah, 
See that? That's why God originally set it apart. So he knew from the Tower of Babel that's not a good idea. So he split them up so that it's easier for people where they can feel naturally in their flesh. It can feel after and follow the right things. Because why? It's all feelings. It's all feelings, our flesh. It's hard to follow what's right and to stay integrated with someone different from you. Why? Because it goes against the, our feelings. That's why every, uh, everything that I do with counseling with people, it's all feelings. Yeah. Everything is feelings with people. So look at Acts 17. Look at this. Look what God says in verse 26. And hath made of what? One blood all nations of men. Oh, see, we're all one blood. Yeah, but look what God did with one blood. For to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the what? The bounds. bounds of their habitation. Come on. He separated all those people in their own zone and territory. Why? Verse 27. Exactly. That they should seek the Lord if haply they might what? Feel, Feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. Let's be honest. It all has to do with flesh, feelings. How can you stay united after that? Divorce, family issues that come up, counseling, all that, all that comes from feelings of flesh. Whether you believe it or not, but everyone has that in their mind. So God understands that that's why he splits them up. He splits them up. Because it's in the flesh. But spiritually, if you're in the spirit, see, you're used to sacrificing feelings of the flesh. And because of that, that's why we can stay together or integrated or unified or whatever you want to call it. So in the spiritual plane, it's possible. But in the fleshly, physical plane, it's not possible. Okay, if this makes things much more understandable, then you're going to understand what I'm going to point out right here. Okay? Now, why do Christians divide themselves from a lot of people, especially Baptists, and they call themselves independent Baptists, and even Bible believers, let's be honest, Bible believers, they might even get their doctrine straight, their practice straight, but let's just be honest, there are some Bible-believing preachers that I cannot be together with and they cannot be together with me. And that boggled my mind for a very, very long time. If you study 2,000 years of church history, that's not how the Lord always worked. Now, does God want unity? Yes, He wants unity. But why is it that everyone is split apart? Here's the idea. We're one body, all right? But the Bible says that one body has many different members. Okay? Here's the idea. Here's a finger. The finger is used to picking up things for the Lord, all right? The foot is used to uh, standing up for the Lord. Now, here's this pastor, who's the foot, who's used to taking a stand for the Lord. This finger, however, is used to picking up people for the Lord. The foot is probably going to accuse the finger, hey, in my ministry, you have to stand up for the Lord more. But you're not taking a lot of a stand up for the Lord like you're supposed to. You're picking up people. And to the foot, that's like compromising. Why? If the foot starts picking up people, think about it. Can the foot pick up people really well? You could pick up things with your toes, but not really that well. Yeah, that's good. It's more equipped to take a stand. That's why they might be more bold. They might be more street preaching centered. They might be more kicking in their sermons, call out false prophets. But the finger, its ministry is not like that. It's more used to picking up people. It's more used to helping out people. Why? Because the ministry is probably a uh, drug addict ministry. Whereas the foot is probably a street preaching ministry. And how many times have I seen Bible believers where they're both right with God, but then they pick fights with each other. One condemns street preaching. Wow. The street preacher condemns the one who's not street preaching. And it's just a big, flat-footed mess. And then the outsider sees both of them as wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's how I see it, and that's how God sees it. Usually it's both sides that are always wrong. But then it's like uh, you can't accuse them at the same time 
for both of them being wrong because you're not in their shoes, so you don't know the, all the nitty-gritty details. So then how do we deal with this? Right? So then this teaching will be incredibly helpful if you understand this idea of unity and separation. Okay? So first of all, the body of Christ is still united. We're united, but you cannot make a different member act the same way as you. Does the Bible says we're supposed to be of one mind, one body? Yeah. My body has one mind, but it still separates to different functions. And it will not mix that foot with the finger, and the finger will separate itself from the foot. It's separated. Did you hear what I said? It's separated from each other, but it's united as one member. Yeah, it's good. What if that uh, hand combines with the foot? Then we're in trouble. Yeah then we're in trouble. They have to stay separated, but united as one body. So then Bible believers can still be in one body of Christ doing the work of the Lord while God uses them all differently. And that's what he's done in church history. The difference is, how you can tell, it, it increases the gap through these four areas that you want to know, okay? Doctrine, tradition, conviction, and personal. Didn't you know false prophets that I kick? Listen up now. False pastors that I kick are still in the same body of Christ as me, and they're doing the work of the Lord? All right, I hate to do this, but I'm going to do this, okay? That way people can understand. People think that I'm just, you know, unreasonable when I call out preachers and then kick them. No, because I have a reason, and I'll explain. So in doctrine, I separate from the Calvinists, all right? I, I have total disrespect for John MacArthur, and you're not going to change my mind. I will stay that way, all right? His Calvinism and his, how he's, uh, his pervasiveness among Christian churches is just a disease and infection that I have to kick what he does. But isn't he helping out the body of Christ? He sure did. Look, I live in California. I'm glad he kicked the stupid L.A. County out there and helped out the churches where we can have more freedom to do our worship service for the Lord. Why? Because he's, because, so that's his, uh, this is taking for granted he's a saved brother, all right? So let's say he is a saved brother. I'm not going to say he's lost because I don't, I'm not the judge of that, but I'm not going to say he's fully saved either, so don't accuse me for saying that he's a saved brother. I'm just putting it at that assumption. That way you can see that even false pastors that I kick or call out, that's your favorite pastor, that I believe we're all the saved uh, brethren together and in the same body of Christ. Yeah, true. All right? Even, uh, even a dirty fingernail is useful to the body of Christ. <laughs> it's good for... It's, even a dirty fingernail, which is dirty and should be rebuked yeah. and called out, it's even useful at times. Yeah. See? All right, so he's, he's just a dirty fingernail. That's it. So then the idea is, is that MacArthur, he's, that step that he did helped so much on the body of Christ. So then see, we're unified in that sense. All right? And the Lord used that dirty fingernail to help out the hand, which, might, which could be this California church right here. See that? But why is it that we have a separation, right? That's a question. Okay, like I told you, the differences grow. The differences grow while we're united. Let me repeat that again. We're all united as one body of Christ. The, un the unity is only based on one condition. And it's not right doctrine. The unity is based on salvation. So if we all are saved brothers and sisters in Christ, it doesn't matter even if they're wrong church or wrong doctrinally, and even a wrong religion, or even a sinner, like a really bad sinner. If they are a saved brother, and if they receive Christ for their salvation, whether you like it or not, we're all in the same body of Christ. It's based on salvation, and the Holy Spirit uses all of them for His glory. He'll use it one way or the other. Exactly right. If the Holy Spirit is used to using even lost sinners for the glory of God, He can even use wicked Christians, yeah. sinful Christians, apostate Christians, doctrinally wrong Christians. Yeah. Okay? So we're all unified. It's only based on salvation, the unity. But this is the problem.
problem with people, okay? Once they hear about Christian unity, they're all thinking, so we all have to get along with each other. And then you get this non-denominational garbage and then pretend doctrines don't exist. No, 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 they exist, okay? They exist and we have to have a separation. The Bible demands separation. Well, the Bible says we're all supposed to be in unity. You're right, but it's based in the spiritual plane. If you are saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're automatically unified with that person. Yeah. Okay? And then what you're going to find out is, actually, those people are the ones who are trying to separate the unity of the Spirit. Those apostate preachers who might be saved Christians, they're the ones who are trying to divide the unity, not us. People think that I'm the one trying to divide the unity. No, I'm not. I'm trying to revive right doctrine, calling them out on that one and trying to get them to go back in right doctrine. And if they won't go back to right doctrine, the Bible says you're supposed to separate from that saved person. Why? Because they're causing split to the unity. That's good. All right, if you don't believe me, let's look at these four conditions, okay? Based on these four things. Look at Romans 16. Romans 16. This is going to be a very helpful teaching. Very helpful teaching. Look at Romans 16. You th Christians nowadays, they're like thinking, well, the only thing you're supposed to separate from is a Muslim. That's it. Uh, no, okay? You're supposed to separate from fellow saved Christians who teach wrong doctrine. Look at Romans 16. Romans 16. And verse 17. 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the what? Doctrine. doctrine which ye have learned. See, those people are the ones who cause divisions. To the doctrine you've learned. Yeah. If you have right doctrine, those people who teach differently from what we teach in right doctrine, they're the ones causing division, not us. The Bible says, and what? Avoid them. You're supposed to avoid them. Here's another one. Look at 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. Notice that a brother in Christ who sins, you're supposed to separate from him. Look, if we have a Christian here who commits like a major sin problem and then it just ruins the testimony of the church, like let's say he stole something from the bank there and then the news media got wind of that one, you think we're going to keep that person there and welcome them in our church and you're our brother? No, the Bible says you're supposed to separate even from a saved brother. Look at this, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And the Bible says, verse 11, but now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a what? Fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one, no, not to what? Eat. God says you're supposed to separate from them. So the first thing we're supposed to separate, see, it's one body. It's all one body no matter what. But one body practices the division from each other. Yeah. All right? Just because a fingernail gets dirty doesn't mean that the whole hand should get itself dirty. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It should separate itself from that. The hand should put a boundary line and say, no, 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 you're not going to bring the germs right over here. You see what I mean? But it's still one body of Christ. It's still one body of Christ. But that doesn't mean that you should get some of the wrong stuff and, that, and tolerate that into it. That's what people mean by unity. You tolerate the wrong stuff. Get it? Mm -hmm. Come on. That's what the world does. That's what churches are doing. This unity garbage that they're doing with Christian churches and all that, what they mean by that is let's tolerate their garbage and bring it inside with us. Do you understand now why God condemns that? So then it's based on doctrine. Doctrine. That's why we segregate. This church, as a group, separates from other Christian church groups. Do you understand? Based on doctrine, based on sin. That's one. Second, second. Now look at this one. This is very important. Secondly is tradition. I want you to go to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. 
Now, while you go to 2 Thessalonians 3, 2 Thessalonians 3, I want you to also look at Ephesians. Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Why do you uh, kick wrong doctrine? Why do you uh, kick sin out there? Because doc wrong doctrine, like I told you before, it disrupts the unity. The unity of what? A perfect unity. The perfection, the cleanliness, the purity in the unity. You see what I mean? That's why God wants that stuff to be separated. Now look at this. It's based on... You have four median things, filters. If you have these four things in your mind, based on four groundworks, so these are actual groundworks and your basis on separation. And we already covered one, that's doctrine, sin, right? Second one is tradition. Third is conviction. Fourth is personal, all right? Personal issues. Those are your basic, the Basis, the, those are the basic groundworks, your actual groundworks, foundations why you separate. These other four are what's inward in your heart that are filters that you have in your mind. Okay. And then ba once you have these in your mind, while using, okay, I separate from you because of our conviction, I separate from you because of our doctrine or etc., then you have a perfect segregation while also a perfect one body, the way it's supposed to be done. Now, I'm going to show you that, okay? First, let's look at these four filters before we come to tradition as 2 Thessalonians 3. Let's look at these four filters, how it works. Notice one of the filters covers this groundwork doctrine. Look at Ephesians. Chapter 4, verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. See that? So God do sees different doctrines as causing what? Disruption to the unity. Look at verse 13. 13. If you don't believe me, till we all come in the unity of the faith. Good, brother. And of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. See that? Wrong doctrine disrupts that unity. That's what the verse points out. So then that's why we have to kick wrong doctrine. And that's why Romans 16 says we have to separate ourselves because it's disrupting our unity. It's disrupting our unity. Look, the fingernail is still part of one body. But keep that dirt in there and have it grow. It's going to disrupt that whole body and infect the whole body. That's true. So then God's like, we got to cut it off. So guess what? You know, we have to make sure we put a separation, a marking line, marked line right there. Why is that? The filter is sheep. You notice that right there? It's because of verse 13. Look at verse 16. That the brethren can unite together. We help each other. The filter is the church, the sheep. That's the first filter. Why do I kick wrong doctrine? Because I have to think about my church, my sheep. Why? I don't want some of my members uh, believe in Calvinist garbage. Amen. Didn't you know that... Uh, there used to be a person with the, uh, oh, how do I say this? Uh, this? I'll just say it, all right? Who was, uh, had an alternative lifestyle. You know what I mean by that? Okay. Alternative lifestyle, but then got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then that poor, uh, that poor person got messed up with Calvinism and thought that he himself was predestinated for eternal damnation. That's an evil doctrine. Yeah. So then I had to fix that. Did I condone the lifestyle? No. And the person knows it's wrong. And then I gave verses and then rebuked and etc. 
But man, that person was going to go... Yeah. Why? Because the person thought, I'm just doomed to eternal hellfire and brimstone. Rather than doing that, why don't you get, encourage that brother with the word of Scripture yeah. and then give, them, give that person something where God can help them change some things. Yeah. Rather than feel like it's doomed and whenever the wrong thought pops out, then, oh, I'm just built to be this way. Because I was elected to be this way. That's totally messed up. So you have to think about the sheep. So because of the sheep and church, you don't think that uh, I'm not going to kick Calvinism? Yeah. Of course I'm going to kick Calvinism. Amen. And I'm sorry if that offends you. Why am I going to kick the wrong Bibles out there and say the King James Bible is the only pure word of God? Because do you realize how many people have got that scholastic mentality and corrected that book? You know what the Bible says? That's a sin. Yeah. Amen. You don't have the fear of God in Revelation 22. It says don't correct the words in that book. Words. Words. Yeah. Words. Each and every word. If you add or subtract, that's condemned. You allow that in your church? You allow sheep in your church to have that kind of mentality? How many pastors have a free conscience on that? Wow. Man. Do you know, pastors, you're accountable for your sheep when they have wrong doctrine and God judges them and that sheep point at you, pastor, and say, why didn't you tell me about this? That's why I kicked those wrong pastors out there. Why? I have to think about sheep and church. Yeah. Think about it. This is just common sense. Why did you guys come to my church? That's right. Let's use some common sense. If I, why? Because you want the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Yeah, yes, sir. And you know that. That's why you came to this church. Otherwise, you can go to any other church out there who have better programs than I do. Why is that? Because I need to feed the sheep, right? And the sheep want the pure grass yeah. to eat. If they want pure grass, I am accountable as a shepherd to give them pure grass. I ain't going to shut my mouth and pretend that there's no impure grass out there. And why don't you eat the dirt out of the grass with that? Like so many shepherds and pastors are guilty of. See that? That's why I have to kick that. Do you understand that? The filter is sheep. When you have sh that, uh, I have a qu uh, one more thing I want to add. I don't have time, okay? I got to hurry up. I don't have much time. But there's, I'm getting sick and tired of onlineers out there, all right, who are just such babies that they do not understand this. You don't understand because you're not a pastor yourself, one. And number two, you never took care of sheep. That's right. You never took care of members, no. so you have no idea what that's like. Yeah. So don't tell me what to do when you're an onliner who watches so many different pastors and just love all of them and want all of them to get along. No. That's your online mentality. You don't have a pastor shepherd's mentality of feeding sheep. Wow. Think about it. Why do you even watch me to begin with? I'm teaching you because you know you're going to get something from the book, don't you? Yeah. That's why you're watching me. Because you know other pastors out there aren't teaching you something from that book. See that? Why don't you use your brain a little bit and understand? I'm sorry if I'm being so mean and sarcastic, but it seems like I have to do something like this to get you to open your eyes right here a little bit. Look, if I'm wrong, oh, you're wrong about King James Onlyism. You're wrong about being anti-Calvinist. You're wrong about dispensationalism for crying out loud. I say this a thousand times and I see these comments popping out. It's getting me sick and tired. Don't judge me without watching the video first, buddy. Look at our playlist on dispensationalism. Look at our playlist on Calvinism. And look at our playlist on defending the KJV. Don't throw in a comment without studying that book yourself first. I'm getting sick and tired of seeing that. Okay, so we realize because of sheep. And the second thing is fleshly limitations. Now, this is very eye-opening. This is very eye-opening. Look at uh, Galatians. Look at Galatians. <coughs> Look at Galatians. Chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, and then we're going to look at verses 8 through 9, verses 8 through 9. Look at verses 8 through 9. The Bible says, 
For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. Now look at this, that we should go unto the what? Heathen. Heathen and they unto the what? Circumcision. circumcision. Now did you see that? They both are sharing the same gospel, which is verse 7. Hypers would like to try to say those are different gospels. No, that's the same gospel. But in verse 7, they know the way they preach that gospel is delivered differently in the ministries. Peter is ministering to Jews when he preaches the gospel, and Paul is ministering to Gentiles when he preaches the gospel. They know that Paul, Barnabas, they're a different calling, different ministry that's separated and different from Peter and the others who are ministering to Jews. That's good. Why is that important? Because when the Jews and the Gentiles started to combine, there were always tensions. But I want all, but we're all Bible believers, aren't we? Shouldn't we all get along? You don't understand. The differences of ministries right here. Look at uh, Paul. He wants to... Look what Paul did. Look, look at this. This is amazing. Look at Acts. Look at Acts. Preaching, look at Acts. Chapter 21. Look at Acts 21. Fleshly limitations. Why? Jews are a different fleshly group of people compared to Gentiles, a fleshly group of people. And the Lord understood that, which is why a long time ago he originally segregated because he knows fleshly limitations of it. Look at uh, Acts 21, verse 20. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, they say to Paul, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. Oh, these are saved Jews. But what do they say of Paul? And they are informed of thee, that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after their customs. Look at that. They're, the Jews... It's always misunderstandings, fleshly limitations. Misunderstandings of another preacher. Yeah, that's good. Okay, that's why Bible believers are so infamous in separation, because they go by reports and misunderstandings of the preacher. Mm. Fleshly limitations. Now look what Paul does. They say... Verse 23, Do therefore this that we say to thee, We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads. So they're telling Paul to become like a Jew. Wait, Paul, but your ministry is to Gentiles. Ah, so look at this. Paul, look at this. He adapts, he works hard to adapt to their Jewish culture. He even adapts to their spiritual conviction to try to unite with them. But did the Jews receive him? No, actually, the Lord told him, look at uh, verse 4, verse 4, And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. But Paul's like, but Peter's a Bible-believing ministry like me, and the people he's ministering to Jews, I have a burden for them too. I'm a better Jew than Peter, Lord, so let me go minister to them. God's like, no, you don't fit them. Wow. You're supposed to be separated from them. But are we all Bible believers? And no, God's like, no, they have different cultures. It's wow. good, brother. And, a, and they also have a, uh, your callings are different in the ministry, how you run things. So you have to stay separated. You can't unite. That's hard for a Bible-believing minister. Sometimes Bible-believing ministers are like, why can't all of our ministries get along? You have to understand the people they're working with and the callings of the ministry that God gave to them are different 
that can cause conflict. But doesn't the Bible say we should be spiritually united? You're right, we're supposed to be, but let's be honest. There's fleshly limitations. That's real good. Can the flesh be eradicated or no? No. And I promise you, no matter how spiritual you are, there's still fleshly limitations. Yeah. Look, look, Paul was the spiritual one. He's trying to unite. He dresses according to their custom, does everything that they want to do. He even speaks in the Jewish language. But look, the fleshly limitation. Look at this. Look at uh, verse 27. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man that teacheth all men everywhere against the people. Look at verse 29. For they had seen before with him in the city Trophimus an Ephesian. Now look at this. Whom they what? Suppose that Paul had brought into the temple. Look at that. The fleshly limitations of the people... Suppose that, oh, I saw Paul doing that before. He's doing that again here. Is this eye-opening? Uh, what do Bible believers do? Oh, I've seen that minister do that thing before. That is bad. And he's doing it here now. People always judge by patterns of preachers. Suppose, though, it's a suppose, what, what, that's a supposition. Do you know what that is? That is fleshly limitations. That is fleshly limitations. So you have to understand that is no matter how well you are spiritually and people are, you have to recognize there's still fleshly limitations and then it's going to still cause that separation, that problem. Okay, the other one. Let's also... Uh, Look at 2 Thessalonians 3, okay? Now look how all of this ties together, okay? 2 Thessalonians 3. Great. If your hand is over here, look what the Bible says. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and then verse 6. Uh, let's look at verse uh, 15, 15. Therefore, brethren, 2 Thessalonians 2, 15, sorry. 2 Thessalonians 2, 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the what? Tradition. Traditions. What is tradition? That's even your own culture. Culture has its own tradition. Church has its own traditions. Traditions are wrong when they are against Scripture, yes. but traditions are right when they are scriptural. That's good. Okay, so we come across doctrine, but now, let's be honest, not everything is written out in Scripture. So churches have their own traditions, okay? Let's be honest, okay, guys? Um, when we do offering, you don't have to do it at a plate, okay? But we do that. Why? Because it's a tradition in the church. Uh, tie, that's not found in the Bible. But it's still scriptural. Why? Because we believe in dressing our best, right? So traditions that are scriptural that we practice. What did the Bible say right here? So God says you have to hold on to the traditions you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle, when, when you've been taught by preachers, the churches. Now look at this. This is interesting. Look at verse 6, chapter 3, verse 6, chapter 3, verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves. You're supposed to separate from every brother, a saved Christian, that walketh what? Disorderly and not after the what? Tradition which he received of us. Yeah, that's good, brother. You know what God says? Separate yourself from the brother who is disorderly, who's a rebel, who's not following our tradition. So then let's say that one pastor, he practices in his church, which is true. Hey, when you preach on the pulpit, you have to wear a tie. But then some guy comes up like, I don't care. I'm not going to wear a tie. There's nothing in the scripture that tells me about that. That's not doctrinally wrong and something like that. But the pastors and the church has a scriptural, they have a tradition that's scriptural. Why? It's based on dressing your best, right? So because that's a church tradition, not self-centered ego, yours, okay? It's a church's tradition, okay? So because of that, what does that mean? You're causing a disorderly conduct. Yeah. So what does God say? You're supposed to separate yourself from that person. 
That's another reason why people separate from each other. Why? They're just rogue, rebel. That's it. Okay? So let's say there's a white person, okay? He just says hi and calls you by a first name. Trust me, that's not going to survive in a, a Korean church or a Chinese church or a Japanese church. Okay, you're supposed to, that's totally disrespectful. You call them by their last name and you give it a bow. Okay? Well, there's nothing in the Bible about that, but see, you're in their tradition. They're, another, uh, another word, culture. And trust me, you're not, you're a disorderly brother and sister in Christ in that church. In that Japanese Korean church. Do you understand this here? That's why there's... Uh, based on that, there's a separation. Yeah. But do we treat them like John MacArthur, like the Calvinists with their wrong doctrine, that uh, because of that, he is our enemy, right? No, we don't treat them as an enemy. We treat people who teach wrong doctrine as enemies. The Bible shows that. It calls them wolves at the book of Acts. They can be the same body of Christ, but they're still enemies. You know that? That's very possible. But... Uh, because they're teaching wrong doctrine. But then, in tradition, you don't. Look at this. The Bible says in verse 14, And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him. Why? It's not to make him an enemy and you fight against him. It's more so that he may be ashamed, yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a what? Brother. Brother. That's the idea, okay? Notice there's different levels and treatments of separation. Person who doesn't go by your tradition, then you don't uh, count him as an enemy, but you, you just admonish him as a brother and you separate yourself from that person. Again, if it's a major doctrine or a major sin, that's when that person becomes your enemy, right there. And that's what we've seen in previous verses. They're enemies to the cause of Christ. But then right here, they're just a disorderly brother. Now, look at, um, look at Romans 14. Romans 14. The third is conviction here. The third is conviction. The third is conviction. Remember Paul, he was trying to unite. And he was even, he was of the mindset of, hey, let's all be in unity with the body of Christ. And he was going by the Jewish culture, culture, the Jewish perspective. But you know what happened? The fleshly limitations. It didn't work out because they had fleshly limitations. But a third thing is conviction. That's why it never worked out with Paul, because of convictions. Look at Romans 14. Romans 14. This is talking about Jewish Customs versus Gentile customs. You know that? That's what Romans 14 is all about. And Paul's saying, look, one is convicted to, you know, be a veg uh, to just eat vegetables, and then another person is convicted that, hey, he can eat whatever he wants. You're not supposed to cast judgment on them. Whatever they're spiritually convicted by, leave them alone between them and the Lord. It's like this. It's like there's a brother in Christ who's convicted about, hey, I'm not supposed to have any internet connection. I don't want anything to do with it because all I see is sin and causes my flesh to get sucked into that. But another brother in Christ has no problem with the internet and freely uses that for the glory of God to, you know, probably uh, spread more Bible-believing truth. Amen. Why? Are both of them wrong or are both of them right? Or See, they're different, but they're both right. Yeah. Why? They both have a different spiritual conviction. Because their spiritual walk with God is different from yours. Look, trust me, a drug, a drug addict, his spiritual walk is going to be way different from a Christian who never struggled with drugs. They're going to have different convictions, okay? Different rules that they make up on you know, uh, where they can hang around, what they can see, what they can do. Look at Romans 14, verse 3. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth, yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. Look at verse 6. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and 
uh, he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. Look at this. God is pointing out right here, everyone has their different convictions on the observances of days and the, uh, the dietary uh, restrictions that they have, the meals that they eat. So God says that's a spiritual conviction. There are things that are not written in the Bible, but you know is scriptural, and what you know is spiritually between you and God. That's right. But it has no application to the other person. See that? There's a person who's spiritually convicted. I cannot watch a single thing on TV. I know that once I get into that, I get sucked into it. I have a spiritual conviction of playing video games. Once I get into that, I know what's going to happen. But then there's another Christian who has a spiritual conviction of, look, I can play. It's okay. You know, It's not going to catch me in the TV. It's okay. It's just for fun with the family. What are we going to do? Watch nothing? Okay? One Christian might be convicted. I can't watch Disney. It's so messed up. So much garbage there. But another Christian family does not see any of that. And they just want their children to have some fun to watch. And hey, let's just watch The Incredibles. It's okay. All right? So you have to understand everyone has spiritual convictions. Yeah. That's how we all get along. Amen, and you can't point fingers at each other and judge each other. Amen. But now here's the eye opener. Because of those different convictions, what's the ideal thing? Spiritually, you're supposed to get along yeah. no matter what, yeah. right? Yes. Okay. Why is it then that the Jews who have their conviction of going their diets and their custom could not, those saved Jewish Christians could not get along with Paul, who has a different conviction of, I can eat whatever I want? Why couldn't they get along? Wasn't Paul following scripture? Hey, let's get along. Let's get along. No, because God said, no, it's wrong. You're supposed to separate yourself from them. Why? Because sometimes conviction can split you. Why, why, why? You forget fleshly limitations. Remember, those Jews had a misunderstanding of Paul, even though Paul didn't have a misunderstanding of them. See, the fleshly limitations involved. That's what he forgets right here. He forgets about that. Another thing right here is what? Conscience. That's another filter is conscience. Romans 14, isn't it based on conscience? Yeah, it's all based on conscience because uh, look at uh, this verse. Keep reading Romans 14. In Romans 14, notice everything has to do with conscience right here. Let's see, uh, it says, uh, uh, I guess the word, exact word conscience is not mentioned here. It must be at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. But anyway, if you look at verse 21, it says, It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that which thing, in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. You know, it's that that all relates to conscience. Uh, look at verse uh, 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to what? Doubtful dispute. See, that all has to do with conscience. Look at uh, verse 5. The last part of verse 5 says, Let every man be fully persuaded in his own what? Mind. Mind. See that? It's all conscience. And if you doubt me that all has to do with conscience, all you have to do is read uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, actually. All of that has to do with eating meat or not eating meat. That has to relate to conscience. If you read 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, if I recall. But anyways, um, uh, we're going to look at... Man, I wish I, could f I, I wish I had that verse about conscience. But uh, forget that. Forget that. I'll have to go back. I'll have to go back. But if uh, any of you can find that later on when you uh, read the verses, you'll find out that conscience has to do with... Uh, Eating. It'll have to do with eating, and it also has to do with how you observe days. There's no doubt that conscience is all related to here, and you can find verses on that. So, Romans 2, 
And then let me show you Romans 2 and Romans 5. This is very eye-opening. Go to Romans 2 and Romans 5. This is important. Convictions cause the separation because the filter is conscience. Why? In your conscience, you're concerned about uh, if it bothers your conscience, that's automatically a sin, God says. So then that's why everyone has different spiritual convictions. Everyone has different spiritual convictions. So then because it bothers your conscience, whereas another believer, it doesn't bother his conscience, right? They freely do those things. That's why there's different spiritual convictions that come out of that. A person has, uh, has a bad conscience of eating you know, chocolate because they know that they shouldn't eat more because they're just gaining more weight or it's unhealthy for them or they're s struggling with cancer or whatever. You know? So then because of that, they have a conscience that bothers them and that's their spiritual conviction. No, I can't eat that. Whereas another brother, he's free to just eat whatever because, hey, there's nothing wrong with eating chocolate over here. Amen. So because of that, that's why everyone's different in their spiritual conviction. What if, here's another eye-opener here. You know why one Bible-believing preacher doesn't get along with another Bible-believing preacher? Because, and then some people who are outside of that, who have no idea what's going on, are saying, why don't you get along with each other? Why don't you get along? You know why? I'll tell you the simple answer. Ignorance is another important factor here. Ignorance. Because you're ignorant of what went on between them. But those two Bible-believing preachers, they know what happened between them. They're conscientious of what happened between them. And who's in the wrong, who's in the right? I don't know, but like Romans 14 said, right, about different convictions, God's the judge of that matter. You're not the judge. God's the judge of that matter. So because God's the judge of that matter, they have a conscience about, hey, that's the reason why I can't fellowship with that brother or sister. Because something happened that you have no idea what's going on. Well, I should know about that. No, you shouldn't know about that. You know why? It's uh, the reason why you shouldn't is because the book of Proverbs says, if you're meddling in a matter that doesn't belong to you, you're grabbing a dog by the ears, okay? Secondly, it's based on conscience. If you're aware of the problem of what happened, then that's why you might go, oh, that's why I can't get along with that Bible-believing preacher. But if a person's conscience has no idea of that, then God doesn't hold that person accountable. Yeah. Look at Romans, okay, if you don't believe me, look at Romans 5 first, okay? Your hand is at Romans 2, Romans 5. Romans 5, 13. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is what? No law. Okay, God won't con uh, count that person with sin if they're ignorant of the law of their conscience. It never said law of conscience. It just says ignorant of the law, pastor. Ah, look at Romans 2. The law is your conscience. Look at Romans 2. Romans 2. 15, 15. Which show the work of the law, right? Written in their hearts, their what? Conscience also bearing witness. That's the key, your conscience. Look, there are some Bible-believing preachers that I know of. You'd be shocked. And you think that, and we're all on the same team together. And we are, okay? But I have something in my conscience that I know. Yeah. And that's the reason why I'm like, look, I cannot get together with you. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Same. Right practice, right doctrine. Yeah. But there's something in my conscience that I know that it's wrong when I get together with them. No, I don't believe in that. Paul did. Look at this. Look at Paul. Paul, you know, different conviction, you know, from the Jews. And then he was trying to get along with them, but there was a fleshly limitation involved. So then they had to separate from each other. They had to separate from each other. Bible believers have different convictions. And then no matter how hard you try to unite, guess what? Sometimes the Lord's will is you need to stay away from each other. Why? Because con convictions can collide. Where conscience can collide, 
And then that's why when you're conscientious of that matter, that's why you have to collide and separate. Do you understand that? That's how it works. Conviction, let's go, let's go again. Convictions come from conscience, right? Romans 14 and other Bible verses. Okay, convictions come from conscience. Okay? What happens when the conscience is aware and it collides and the convictions collide? You can try to get along. Sometimes that's the Lord's will. But let's be honest. Sometimes it's not the Lord's will because there's a fleshly limitation. No matter how hard you try. Well, I'm so spiritual. Yeah, you can try. You can try to be spiritual. But let's be honest, you have a fleshly limitation. That's good. No matter how spiritual you try to act. That's, real. That's why it's best to separate. You don't believe me? Uh, you ever uh, fought with uh, your partner before? And you love each other so much. You can be as spiritual as you want to. But let's be honest, you both have a fleshly limitation. And you need a separation a little bit. What I mean by that is like a little time out and distance for, from each other a little bit. Right? Yeah, some of you, don't, don't act like you're all spiritual and, oh no, we talk it out, you know. We talk it out, we get along. No, uh, yeah, sure, sure, all right, sure. No, when the guy's in anger mode, he's like, I need a minute, I, 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 don't I, I need a minute. And the woman who's emotional, oh, leave me alone, I need a minute. There's a fleshly limitation no matter how spiritual you try. Amen, amen. All right, I hope this is incredibly eye-opening and helpful for you. But let's say this. Let's say the person, he's, he's an outsider, and he has no conscience of what's going on. And why can't blankety, uh, blank, blank, Bible-believing pastor get along with blank, blank pastor? I can get along with both of them. Why don't they? Because you have no conscience of that. You're an outsider. You're ignorant of the matter. And it's best to stay that way. It's best to stay that way so you can be more free yeah. to get along. But the more you're conscientious of that, the more you have to put restrictions yeah. and division and separation. That's so good. Isn't this really good? Yeah. Look, oh, we should get along. We're one mind of Christ. <laughs> you try, okay? You try. The, the finger is doing the right job picking up and the foot's doing the right job taking a stand. But guess what? Its functions will conflict somewhere and the way it's thinking and the way this guy's thinking in their conscience, there's going to be a collide. Yeah. That's true. Why? It's called fleshly limitations. No matter how spiritual you are. Okay. Praise the Lord. This is great stuff. Okay. The next one is uh, Acts. Look at Acts 15 and Genesis. Here are my two favorite chapters on separation. Look at Genesis 13 and Acts 15. Genesis 13 and Acts 15. My two favorite chapters on separation. Let me know if I'm cut. All right. I'm cut out. All right. Let's look at Acts 15. And then uh, we'll look at... Genesis 13. I want different ministries to get together. I mean, our blowout is evidence of that, right? You saw the differences of uh, the styles, the personality of the preachers and the ministries and everything, the culture. The blowout is a beautiful uh, picture of that one. But let me, uh, but the sad thing is this, the fat, sad thing, if you have to understand, we all have fleshly limitations. And as much as I want to blow out every single day, I'm going to be very honest with you, I don't think we can do that. And I'm sure every one of those pastors can agree with me too. That's going to be impossible. That's going to be impossible. Look at uh, Genesis 13. The last filter is reality. That's important. Reality. A great example is like the one that I gave to you. Uh, no matter uh, how much you try to get along with your partner, let's, let's be honest, you know. Yeah, you both are sinning, you know, when you fight. But realistically speaking, you need that distance. You need that separation for a moment. That's just realistic. Otherwise, you don't understand, you know, how relationships or marriage work at times. 
oh, we got to talk it out. We got to face it. We got to talk it out. And I'm not letting you go. Look, you're supposed to talk it out. You're supposed to pray together and stuff like that. But trust me, you know, that's not realistic. Come on. All every single minute and second and hour. You have to find the right time to do that. You have to be in prayerful mode and you have to find the right moment to do things. Look at, uh, if you think that's, uh, no, we should uh, all be together, look at Genesis 13. Look at verse 5. Here's reality when reality hits. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together. For their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between, me, between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren." Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. That's what Abraham said. Wait a minute, look at this. Abraham and Lot are not enemies. Do you understand that? Abraham and Lot uh, are in relationship with each other. They're close family members. But guess what? Close family members sometimes have to separate. Yeah, that's good, Why? It's called reality. Why? Because their livestock is growing so big that there's now strife between them. Why? They're just so confusing. And then no matter how hard they work out the logistics to get along, it just can't work. And when reality steps in, it's not a matter of who's right and who's wrong. Only the Lord knows who's right and wrong with which shepherd was beating up the sheep more and the other Lot's shepherd and Abraham's herdsmen were fighting with each other. Only God knows, okay? Only God knows. But it's not like Abraham is at fault, Lot's in the right, Lot's in the right, Abraham's in the wrong. No, we'll never know. The point is, it's called reality. It becomes so complex, you can't really point fingers who's right and wrong. It's so complex that the best thing is, hey, let's separate. It's good, brother. Let's separate. That way we don't get this issue, these problems. Look at uh, Acts. Look at Acts 15. Acts 15. Acts 15. Look at verse 36 through 39. 36 through 39. Another favorite chapter of mine of uh, Bible believers uh, separating from each other. All right? Bible believers, not doctrinally wrong or Paul state. No, Bible believers. Why? Based on something personal. That's the last one. Personal. It's just something personal that happened. What is it? Lot sinned and Abraham uh, lost his temper. No, 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 no. It's just something personal. The, she the sheep was just too big. The sheep was just too big. So then they had to separate from each other. Look at Acts 15, 36. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. Who's right and who's wrong? Guess what? The Holy Spirit don't care that he never mentioned. What was the Holy Spirit pointing out? A reality. That you're going to have personal differences that will cause a separation. Somebody did something personal that you disagreed with that even, look at this, verse 39, the contention was so sharp. It might be a big blow-up fight that the person's like, I'm not talking to you ever again, something like that. Yeah. Contention is so sharp. Well, what went on and who's right, who's wrong? Proverbs, it's not, uh, don't meddle in a business that's not yours. It's like taking a dog by the ears. The Bible says not to do that. So it's verse 36 through 39. So then because of reality hitting that, hey, it's best to separate, it just happens. It's not who's right and who's wrong. There's just a separation going on. And only God can tell you who's more in the right and who's more in the wrong. So do you see these levels of separation going on? It's like there are people that you know saved Christians. 
that you have to treat as enemies. All right? And then preach against them, rebuke them. Other Christians who are disorderly and you cannot treat them as an enemy, however, at the same time, you can't really treat them like a brother. You have to correct them. And you got to say they're wrong. And then there are just other brothers whose convictions and conscience is just so different that you just have to just stay away from them and that's it. And you don't have to talk bad about them. You just shut your mouth, don't mention their name and just leave them be. And then there are other brothers that you might not like, you strongly have a disagreement with that's personal, that's pretty bad. But then uh, that's called reality hitting. It's reality hitting and you just have to separate. And it's not a matter of people finding out who's right and who's wrong. No, it's just called none of your business, okay? And then you just stay away from that. Just stay away from that. That's the idea. That's the idea. When I do my separation and call out people, look, I do it for very good reasons, okay? And don't accuse me for being uh, divisive. I do it for very good reasons. And there are people that I unite with and get along with, and then people criticize me for that one. That is none of your stinking business. I have good reasons for that one. And that should be helpful to the saved Christian as well, as we all focus on one body. As the body of Christ goes down for many years, there's going to be members who are dirty and apostate and messed up. Other, function, uh, other parts of the body who are just doing their job, their function, but are very different. And other members of the body who can just get along. So maybe five fingers might get along with each other that they could pick up something together. And then one foot can get along with the other foot and they can get along together and create a walk. See, this is called the body of Christ. And that's why there is a thing <laughs> called uh, segregation from one part to the other. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching will be incredibly helpful to the people as they practice their Bible-believing Christian walk of unity and separation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.